Good evening, everybody. My name's Tony Parker. I'm the, currently the accumulate recorder for Cheshire. So tonight we're going to have a look at the spider wasps or the Pompilidae. Um, basically, it'll be looking at the bit about the bi biology and behaviour to start with. Then we'll go through some of the species you're likely to come across. There'll be a bias towards the northwest because basically that's where the project's based. And at the end, we'll have a look at sort of some of the list of the local species that are out there and we'll talk a bit about recording. So the family itself is cosmopolitan. There's over 5,000 species across the world with subdivided into six subfamilies. They're prim predominantly tropical in distribution, basically because that's where all the spiders are. You know, they hunt all kinds of spiders up to the size of tarantulas and some of the really big ones. So, but in this country, they, they tend to be specialised on lots of the smaller species. Currently, we have 44 species in the UK, which are subdivided into 15 genera. Of these, about two species are still restricted to the Channel Islands. Looking at the structure of a typical Pompilid, the antennae, like a lot of Hymenoptera, 12 segments in the female, 13 in the male. So that's a good start to sort of working out the sex of the, the insect. Basically, because if you use the only key that's available, it does, it does work separately on males and females. We'll look at that later. The inner margins of the eyes are straight, which is a feature which can be used to distinguish between other wasp families. The thorax has got three segments. At the top of the front, there's a structure called the pronotum, which is a plate on top of the thorax. If you look at it under a microscope, on most Pompilidae, it appears as a horseshoe shaped. So that's another, another feature that which does come up regularly in the keys. The most obvious feature of Pompilids are the legs. They're very long. In, if you look at the hind femora, in, they actually extend well beyond the length, length, end of the abdomen. Basically, because most of these wasps spend most of the time running around on the ground chasing spiders. They, they obviously do fly, but not to any great extent. So basically, they're sort of more suitable for not only for fast running, but they also allow the wasp to keep its vital organs outside the range of the spider because let's face it spiders are pretty efficient predators themselves so if you're going to have to, to take one on you need to sort of look at all of the all the advantages you can so obviously having long legs means you can keep your body above the spider and out of the way of its fangs you'll also note that each the tibia of these legs have got these obvious spines which are probably sort of used for sort of manipulating the prey and in some species, if you look at the sort of the four the four legs, they have a sort of series of three to four small spines here. These are used basically for excavating nest holes. Some species will use already available cav cavities to store the prey. Others will actually excavate their own nest burrows. The wings tend to be sort of quite long. And they do vary in coloration. Some, like this one, have a sort of a brownish tinge. Others are clear, but have sort of several bands towards the tip. And another feature is if you see a pompilid at rest, the wings aren't folded flat on top of the abdomen. They're held in a sort of shallow V shape. Again, there's a, section, there's a difference in the sexes as far as the abdomen's concerned. This female has six segments and ends in a sting, whereas the male has seven and ends in the sort of genital plates on the underside. So the female, like most, like all the Hymenoptera, males don't have the sting. And there is a sexual dimorphism that, that females are generally larger than the males. Now, the behaviour is pretty unique amongst Hymenoptera. They're often seen making short, rapid movements across bare ground or through short vegetation looking for prey. They, they never sort of keep still. They're always sort of twitching on the go. In fact, I read in one of the, some of the literature, somebody actually referred to them as Hymenoptera, Hymenoptera neurotica, which seems like a very 
that description. Basically, it's usually the female that's doing that. It's they're hunting spiders as food for the larvae, and generally, as with most predatory insects, insects they're looking for one spider for each larvae, and then once the spider is caught, the female paralyzes the prey, and it's then carried or dragged across the ground. It's these things very rarely fly with the prey. They do sort of carry it, drag it along the ground to a space where it's temporarily concealed or it's usually taken to a previously prepared nest. Then, as we'll see with this, looking, when we look at some of the species, the nest sites vary quite, quite, quite widely. Once the sort of the prey is in the nest, the wasp will lay, lay in single leg on the abdomen this actually is interesting because there are some species that seem to be right-handed and some species seem to be left-handed as depending on where the prey is actually laid on the species on the spider they always seem to lay the, the egg on the same at the same place on hatching the larvae then burrows into the host's body and then begins to suck its internal fluids the spider then sort of will eventually die after the sort of larvae has matured in. They usually go through about five instar stages and then when they become mature they either overwinter as a mature larvae or, or a pupa. It seems that fertilized eggs seem to be laid on larger spiders whereas those on unfertilized, unfertilized eggs seem to be laid on small spiders basically because these produce the males which are generally smaller so obviously you need large, much more food for a larger female. The female, the males, the males usually emerge will emerge first the following year, and they'll sort of set up territories and act, actively seek seek new females with which to mate. Most species are what we refer to as multivoltine. Basically, they'll have numerous generations throughout the flight period, but there are some which just have one generation. It's sort of so it varies in species. And there's actually one species which actually overwinters as an adult female. Pompilides seem to have very few natural en enemies or that, we've, that we've come across. Sitting Delidae are actually the tiger beetles and Acilids are robber flies. So they'll, they're both predators and they're obviously found in the same sort of habitat as the pompilids and therefore they obviously sort of they're obviously predators of these we there's very little known about parasite parasitoids from pompilids there's little information out there that i've come across it seems that ants can be a frequent nuisance for females trying to produce a nest and some parasitic diptera such as sarcophagids, are actually often seen shadowing pompilids, which are transporting prey. Outside the UK, things like Bombilidae, Anic Newman, and Chrysid wasps have been reared from pompilids, but so it's possible that some of the British species may attack pompilids also. But the main enemies are actually other pompilids. Any prey that's sort of left unattended, whether it's hidden wet for while the female constructs a nest or left for any other, other reason, will, will obviously be taken by another species, another Pompilid wasp as of the same or from a different species. And as you'll see, there are one or two species which are kleptoparasites, which basically they'll wait for a one species of wasp to catch a prey and then they'll interrupt the speed, interrupt force the host species off and then lay their own egg on the spider. So there are various sort of life cycles which we'll, as we, which we'll see later on. Okay, we've got 15 genera in the UK. Dipogon is one with three, spe three species. You can't see it on this specimen, but the sort of the main characteristic is the four wings have two dark bands towards the Tip towards the tip. They're generally all black species. 
this species is widely distributed. It's often found in a variety of habitats where you usually find looking for dead wood for how to hide its prey. It seems to be solely exclusively predating on the spider Suggestria synoculata. It hasn't been sort of seen so co collecting any other species. And none, and none of these species have ever been seen to be sort of visiting flowers. The adult females will do need to visit flowers to feed on nectar, but sort of these species don't seem to have been observed doing that. It, the spider, once it's caught, is dragged to a nest by its spinnerets. And unlike a lot of the other pompilids, the female will actually chew up the spider, reducing it to a soft mass. This is a practice which humans tend to do, and it makes it basically easier for the larvae to feed on. The nest is usually made in pre-existing cavities, often crevices in wood or old beetle holes. And the cavity is sealed by the, site, the spider's silt, which is actually produced, which is applied from by the female wasp using its maxilla, maxillary bristles. Variegatus is a sort of another widely distributed. It's a medium-sized species, again with sort of long wings with a double band, double dark band towards the tips. It's it's the female is easily separated by looking at the propodial structure, which is basically towards the top of the abdomen. The males have sort of a genital plate, which has got distinctive long hairs, which you need to look at ventrally. Again, this is, seems to be sort of preying on just one species of spider, Cysticus cristatus. It's quite a long flight period compared to some of the other species, often on the wing from mid-May to early October. And this is a species which can be found in almost any open habitat, including gardens. Just to be aware that the species accounts that we're using are taken from the BWARS website, and a lot of these were actually produced in the late 1990s, so they're not totally up to date, but they're unfortunately they're the most recent ones we could find. Again, like the previous species, it, the nest is in any pre-existing cavity, dead plant stems, dead wood, and even in the mortar of old walls and old snail shells. The cavities themselves are plugged with grains of sand and other soil and frag plant fragments. And again, these are bound together using silt from the spider. Several cells may be produced in the same space if there's enough room. Acnemus is the largest genus, there's 13 species. These are tend to be sort of black and red wasps on the whole with sort of brown, dark, mostly dark brown wings. This is a medium sized species that are recorded throughout most of the UK. Its habitat is mainly heathland, acid grassland and coastal areas. And it's most frequently found in late summer. This one preys on a variety of species, mainly Lycosidae, plus occasionally Tomicidae type spiders. Occasionally, uh, some, among this genus, one of the sort of characteristics is there's usually a sort of pet, the wing is actually darker towards the tip and there's usually a sort of faint little what like a window area an un unobvious pale area in, towards the tip of the wing but this doesn't have that so it's it's either absent or it's very poorly developed the male subgeminal plates genital plate is fairly distinctive so when you try to identify these it has to be dissected out properly Unfortunately, there's very little data regarding nesting behavior for this species but looking at related species they tend to ex excavate nests in soil and they'll often take advantage of natural cavities and they will use abandoned acculeate burrows from solitary wasps or solitary bees this is a sort of another medium-sized frightening species it can be sort of abundant throughout the UK, but only it is quite locally. It's quite scarce in this in this part of the world. 
It's usually found in open situations on sandy soil, but it will be found. You will find it on limestone, grassland, and amongst all and along all the hedge hedgerows and earth ver, uh, road verges. We think this is one of the species which is univoltine, basically, so it has one generation. The females fly from July to August, and the males mainly June or July, and mainly fly during July. It feeds on a variety of different spiders. The captured spider is actually, once it's paralyzed and hidden, this species actually digs its own burrow to conceal it. Although she can take advantage of natural cavities in an abandoned burrows. The spider is usually stored in a cell and then the egg is actually laid on the prey. The entrance tunnel of, to the cell is usually quite short and will often lead to several cells. And the same female will produce and prepare provision several such nests and the young will then overwinter as mature larvae. The perturbed spider wasp is one of the a largest of the Pragnemi species. It can be up to a length of about 17 millimetres in the female. It's quite characteristic because it's basically got plenty of, if you look at it, it's got a large amount of erect hair on the sort of face and the propidium, which is sort of this area around the top of the abdomen. Females are often seen searching on the ground in the open, search, looking for prey. Again, it's another univoltine species, but it is on the one queen quite early. It will be sort of around from mid-April onwards. And it's most frequently found in a variety of open habitats. And it does, like unlike a lot of the species we're looking at it does it can even be found on a variety of flowers most particularly wood spurge but it will visit things like blackthorn even dandelions and willow it's very little known is there's very little known about the nesting habitat of this species although it's probably sort of uses the same sort of system as previous those previous species excavating cavities using existing cavities, which they can use to excavate several cells. As in the loss of the, this genus, they're very difficult to identify, although this can be can sometimes be identified by size and the extent of hairs on, the, on both ephemera of the fore and mid, mid legs. Exaltata is one of the largest of the genus. It's, it's common in the south, generally, but there are scattered records in Wales and Ireland and does stray up in northern England. It's found in a variety of habitats, usually in places, often open, open areas such as hedgerows, heathland, quarries, and will tend to be found on brownfield sites fairly regularly. The majority of records are in late summer and it feels seeds on preys on a variety of sp spiders, usually sort of ground dwelling ones, including things like jumping spiders. So you'll often see it looking, searching on vertical spaces, vertical spaces for prey, prey items. Again, it nests in pre-existing cavities, although it will excavate its own nests if necessary. This is another species where the male needs to be identified by extracting the genitalia. So like most of these species, if you're going to identify them, you will need to take, a spec take specimens. We only have one species of Aliodurgus, which is found mainly in the south of England, mainly on sort of dry, sandy soils. Again, it's got quite a reasonably long flight period from June into early October, but the peak, main peak seems to be July, July and August. And it seems to prey mainly on orb-web spiders. The female, it, it's a, another black and red species, and you can see just about make the about these dark patches on the forewings. The female can be told can sometimes be told it has this as a short curved spine on the tibia of the front legs, which can be quite obvious. The ma the male, which is this one has does have sort of patches of red on the legs, 
and usually has a white spotted tip to the abdomen. And say so there are some species which you can tell without dissection, but a lot of them you'll need to sort of at least collect a specimen and stick it under a microscope. This stores its prey in short vertical burrows excavated in sandy soils. The prey is then sort of inserted and then sort of sealed in. Cryptochylus is another one with just one species. Its modern records are mainly entirely from coastal sites, mainly in southwest England and and the New Forest. So it's now it was originally a red data book specimen species, but it's now been upgraded to vulnerable as we have more information on it. But even so, that was 1991, so its status could have again changed. It uses a variety of habitats, but it's mainly sort of coastal areas, landslips and cliff tops. But it'll also use sort of gravel and sand pits as well. And it usually, its main prey is a large web building spiders. It's one of our largest pompilids, female reaching up to 15 millimetres. And it was once considered one of our rarest, although we seem to have quite a few more records in recent times. It's a, it's a large black and red species with dark tips of the forewings. It make, creates multi cell nests in existing cavities. In fact, in Poland, this species has actually been observed nesting in the burrows of small mammals, in particular moles, where the burrows act as en entrance chambers for the cells, which are then excavated very close to each other. The female is very faithful to the nest site and is often difficult to sort of drive away. And she'll often use a chamber for shelter during, bed, during bad weather and at night. Evergetes is three species in the genus, but again, black and red specimen, mainly medium size. This species is Crassicornis, it's widely distributed throughout the UK, and it can be encountered on most open habitats. This is a kleptoparasitic species, probably preying on the various species of Arachnus from the Arachnospilla genus. Although, it does, although the specific no, hosts don't seem to have been identified as yet. But according to Day, which is the sort of handbook on Pompilidae, Arachnospilla, Anceps and Anopleus nigerimus seem to be the main hosts in the UK. It's one of the most frequently encountered of the spider wasps because it spends lots of its time searching open ground for, nest, for its nesting species, for its host species. It grows about 10 millimetres, so it's about medium size. It's usually sort of, say, black and red. The, the red tends to be sort of fairly dull, and often the first segment of the abdomen has got black borders to it, although that's not really obvious on this specimen. The red-legged spider wasp is also another species which originally had a genus with originally one species, although in recent years, another spe species has colonised the UK, which has complicated matters because the two do look very similar. It's a large species. It's sort of up to about 40 millimetres long. So it's mainly black with white tib. You can note the, the hind tibia and the base of the femora here are red. You can see the tibia there. And there's two, two to three pairs of white spots on the abdomen. It's, it's a large, robust species, widespread throughout lowland Britain. It's often mainly sort of found on coastal dunes and inland heaths, but you'll also find it in gravel pits and in gardens from usually May for September. And it's a specialist hunter of the orb web spiders. So, and it's a good place to look for this is on, on, bell on bellifers, which seems to be its main plant that it feeds on. As I say, it was originally just one species of Epicyron in the country, but recently Epicyron gallicum has been, has been sort of found. The main, the main distinguishing feature is that the, in Rufipes, the female has 
four comb spines on the front tarsus, whereas Gallicum has only three. However, the males are very similar, so they require far more critical examination. The nest is usually excavated in loose sand, and after the prey, the prey is captured, it's stored locally until, and in, usually above ground in a nearby plant until the nest is complete. The nests of this species are often parasitized by the endangered species Evergetes pectinipes, which is only found in the sand dunes around Deal and Sandwich. Once the egg of Evergetes has been laid, the actual wasp, the, the wasp will itself will consume the, the original egg of this species before, and then her, the, the, the parasite will it in will lay her own egg in its place. We're, this species is also parasitized by Serapales maculata, which we'll look at later on. The Monotus is only again a genus with just one species. There's two forms of this insect. This one which is has this sort of blood red parts on the on the thorax, whilst another form is just entirely black. It's an extremely elusive species. The number of the records seems to be confined to heathland sites, mainly in southern England. So it's currently listed as endangered. And, of, and unusually, this can be collected by sweeping low-lying vegetation. It does tend to spend quite a lot of time above of, off the ground. Its main prey species seems to be Chiroscanthium erasicum, one of the foliage spiders, as they're called. Basically, it's possible that to find this wasp, it's usually be might be better to look at the sort of, for the webs of the prey species rather than the insect itself. The, the adult wasp att female attacks the spider within, the, within its actual web itself, which is used constructed in rolled up leaves or the flower heads of grasses. So the wasp doesn't actually produce a nest of its own. The body shape allows it to sort of sneak in, into the host webs where it lays its egg. So the spider remains alive for about 11 days after the pompilid larvae hatches, by which time it's been so soaked dry, basically. Aegineodius is a genus of three species. This one is mainly, this Cinctellus is mainly confined to sort of southern Britain, although it does extend northwards to Worcestershire and place in the Midlands, and it has been found in parts of Suffolk. It's mainly found in dry situations, often on sandy soils, used from June to August. And it's mainly found looking for jumping spiders, basically. So it's often found investigating vertical faces, such as cliff walls, upturned root plates of trees, or walls of houses, that kind of thing. The wasp itself utilizes a wide variety of natural cavities. It uses abandoned aculeate burrows, empty mud cells and snail shells to produce its nest. The entrance is Block, usually blocked with detritus. It's quite a small species, and it's from about four to seven millimeters long. Usually black with sort of red legs. This is a female. You can tell it's got a whitish face or clipeus, and it has white, often has white marks on the head and the thorax. The male has sort of is generally more all black with the face and the the face and the base of the hind tibia just having white marks. So you can't tell them apart. But I say these are, there are three species of this genus which are very similar. There's only one genus, one species in the genus Pompilius, which is Cinereus, which is one of the most widely distributed species. It's a basically an all black insect with very short gray hairs. And the four, you see the four wings as well, have got these characteristic black tips. It's widely distributing, distributed in Britain and Wales. Most of the records seem to be from the coast, and its range does extend northwards into Scotland. It's found mainly on coastal sand dunes and in sand, also in sand pits and in sandy heath, whenever, anywhere basically, there's extensive bare sand. 
and it mainly feeds on sort of ground dwelling spiders, wolf spiders, that kind of that those species. The wasp generally is one of those which excavates its own burrow. You can see you see on this just about say on the foreleg here the sort of series of spines which it'll use to scrape away the sand. If the sand is damp, the, the grains are actually loosened with the mandibles to begin with. Once the nest is complete, the spider then inserts the the, sp the spider is then inserted and temporarily buried, and then uh, in, in this species, the spider doesn't actually, it's not totally paralysed by the sting. Once it's actually in, interned in a nest, it'll actually partially recover. And basically what it does, it sort of wanders around the nest space, fit, lay, laying down silt, which holds and basically holds the sand grains of the structure of the cell together. The, the, eventually, the sort of spider will die once the larvae has hatched out and had its feet. But, but again, this is a sort of the only one, only species we know of in, in which this happens. Arachnus spiller is seven species, usually black and red and insects with sort of brownish wings. Some have distinct, distinct white markings, but not all. Spisser is one of the most common species, widely distributed throughout the British Isles, found in a variety of habitats, from heathland, open woodlands, and to coastal habitats. Another univoltine species, usually occurring in late summer. It's a medium-sized species, group of species. This is one of the largest, it's about sort of 10 millimetres long. The female doesn't have the tarsal comb, so it has to use existing burrows to make its nest. It, it, this species in particular will often attack spiders in their own nest burrows. The, bur the, the, the wasp will actually remove the, whatever's blocking the burrow, enter the nest and then stings the spider. The spider is only sort of slightly paralyzed and as the wasp larvae eats it, it she often, the spider will often eat her own eggs at the same time. So the period of egg laying to construction of the cocoon, cocoon is often accelerated and can be as little as 14 days in this species. The heath spider wasp, as, as its name suggests, is slightly more restricted in its distribution, although it is found throughout the UK and in the Channel Islands, but in most in northern areas, it seems to be more disrespected to the coastal areas. It's found on most soils, except perhaps sort of some heathland, and it feeds on a wide variety of spiders. It's a medium-sized species, up to ten millimeters long. Again, the female can be characterised by having the sort of comb spines on the fortarsus and of course granular surface of the propodium round about here. And the male has a sort of characteristic subgenital plate which has a tuft of short hairs around the apex. So it's only visible under a microscope. The prey is captured and then transferred to the ne nesting location, usually hidden in local vegetation while the Insect, the other wasp, the other female produces the burrow, which is then sealed by sort of plant material and other detritus. Minutula is a widely distributed, mainly in England. Despite the name, it is quite a sizable insect. It's similar in size to most of the other species in the genus. And the male is quite large, is actually often larger than some of the males of the other spe related species. It's widely distributed in England, although it's still listed as notable because its distribution is quite localised. It's mainly found in sparsely, sparsely vegetated situations such as downland and heathland and on the coast. We're not sure about the prey species. There's very little known about this, this species. So it is typical of it's a typical red and black spider. 
it's very, very similar to Arachnospilla spisa. So you have to be careful when trying to distinguish between these two species. Vialis is another locally common species. It has been found northwards into Lancashire, although it's mainly sort of a southern species and throughout England and Wales. It's a species of loose sandy soils on mainly in coastal sites, and it's another single brooded flying sort of late summer. And the only prey species that we know of are various cysticus species. I say very little known about this species, but basically from the related species, it's likely to construct a nest in loose sand, having, produced, having captured a spider, which is hidden locally in nearby vegetation. Nopleus is a genus of five species. It's widespread, but very local in England. It's not listed, so it's in either shirt or fault, so its status isn't known properly. Males and females are often found on wet stones exposed in stream beds, and they can also be found on the margins of gravel pits and sand, sand quarries. It's a medium sized species up to sort of 12 millimeters long. And it's, sort of, it's mainly all black with a sort of suffusion of many often variable sized hairs, some of them quite long in various parts of its body. Those are live near sort of near streams will often project make create multiple cells underneath stones which are then stuck with spiders which actually live under the stones those that live in sand pit areas the females prey on spiders that run over the surface of the very shallow water at the edges of pools in germany this species has also been found nesting between paving stones in a, in urban areas the nest can be as deep as about nine centimetres and contain up to about seven cells. One spider is placed in each cell after it has been ex excavated. And there's often lots of interaction between various females, which generally will quite happily rob each other's cells and sort of fight with neighbouring individuals. Black spider wasp is another sort of all black species with a silver, silvery pubescence of sort of fine hairs. It's widespread throughout Britain, mainly associated with sort of dry grassland. And it feeds on a variety of prey. The species nests in a variety of situations. Sometimes it'll be found in understones, in hollow plant stems and deserted aculeate burrows and snail shells but it can produce sort of its own nest if, if the soil is suitable. This one has been found at relatively high altitude compared to other species. And a nest of four cells was found under a stone on Moorland, 400 meters up in Perthshire. So it sort of seems to be able to sort of tolerate sort of quite high, higher altitude than most other species, which tend to be more lowland. Therapales are sort of two species, which is sort of quite colourful for this group. This sort of black, mainly black with some red and yellow, red and yellowish or whitish markings on various parts of the anatomy. Maculata is a sort of medium-sized species. It's got this. It's mainly black. Well, it's got these whitish markings on the head, the thorax, reddish legs, and it's usually sort of mark pale whitish markings on the abdomen as well. Although it's in this speak in this image there, obviously concealed by the wings. It's a rare heathland species. It's only tempted to be re recorded in Dorset, Hampshire, and Surrey. Although that was sort of 20 odd years ago, it may have sort of moved out since then. Mainly found in sort of sand pits, heaths, and coastal dunes. We don't know the exact flight period, but similar spe a similar species, Variegatus, is found in July and August. So this probably sort of has a similar flight period. Little is known about its life history, but they are, this species are kleptoparasitic. Basically, they'll intercept female pompilids of other genera while they're dragging spiders to the nest. 
the Serapeli species will drive off the other Pompili so that she can then insert the egg into the lung books of the prey species. Then this species just disappears. It takes no further interest in the prey, although it will rely on the original captor of the spider to return and fitting, provisioning her own nest cell. The Serapeli's larva hatches first and then destroys the egg of the host, Pompili, prior, prior to feeding on the spider. Oplopus is one large species of large genus, but only one species found in the UK. It's mainly a southern species, southern species, as far as we know. It's probably prone to under recording because it's very secretive. And it's not listed, it's recognized as a nationally notable, but not listed in the red data list. Mainly found in woodland, especially where there's around streams and any marshy areas. These fields mentally on Clubionidae Club species of spider, which, and it has a rather complex nesting behavior compared to other species. Once it catch, catches its prey, it, first thing it does is actually chew the legs off, which obviously makes the spider easy to cart around. And also it means that, you no, know, the legs of a spider probably aren't that very nutritious. So that's, there's no real point in sort of keeping them on. It will then sort of drag the species to a cavity. It nests a built-in variety of situations. They often they can be found in stones, under, beneath stones, in stone walls, tree, tree stumps, beetle burrows, under bark and in crevices and tree trunks, and even in galls of various wasps and in the empty burrows of worms, old snail shells and even in man-made situations. And they've often been found in other, mixed with other Herculeates, such as Anthophora, Anthophora species of bees and Ancestroceras wasp species. Females actually construct small barrow-shaped cells, which are laid horizontal. These are manufactured from small pellets of clay obtained from damp areas, such as river banks or beneath stones and water is collected separately to a nest building. And the nest can sell, themselves may consist of 10 or more cells arranged horizontally in a block. These cells are mainly are constructed prior to the prey capture and are stocked with a variety of spiders, which she, the female catches am, amongst vegetation. One, one prey item is placed in each cell. Unlike most of the other pompilids, the, the, the wasps may actually fly when it carries small prey into it, prey individuals, whereas as in usual pumpility, the prey are usually dragged along the ground. So it's got quite an interesting life history. And so sort of, I say, unfortunately, it's not one that has been recorded in this area. These are the species that we have, repaint have recorded in the Northwest. We have 19 species in Lancashire, which we every the information taken from Ben Hargreaves' book, the Lancashire, the bees, wasps, and ants of Lancashire. That just covers Lancashire, North Merseyside, Greater Manchester has very little information on. Nobody seems to sort of want to study that area. There are 21 species been identified in Cheshire, but as we can see. Five of them haven't been recorded since 1950. The problem with Pompilids that they're very, very under recorded, mainly because they're not sort of easy to come across. And they're also very difficult to identify and difficult to, to catch as well. In, in, in Lancashire, the, the most commonly recorded species seems to be Pompilius cinereus which has been recorded from 12 tetrads. A tetrad is a two kilometer square. So if you think about it, that's a very small part of the county. And most Lancashire spe species tend to be recorded along the Sefton coast, which is probably related to where most of the work, work has been done. Whereas in Cheshire, the, most, the commonest species seem to be recorded as being Prout Nemis exaltata, which has only been recorded in 11 
tetrads. Most of the Cheshire species tend to be sort of recorded in the Delamere area or sort of the North Wirral, where the sort of sand, sand dune areas are, which are probably easier to work. One of the problems we have with recording pompillies is they're not particularly easy to catch. I mean, a net, a net is the only really way of catching them. If you find one on a flower, that's pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, most of these tend to be wandering around on the ground. So if you put, and if you put the net on top of the insect, it just stays put. And it will basically just head for any gap between the net and the, from the, and the ground. So basically the only really way, habitat you can work properly is bare sand. And even then you have the difficulty if you put the net on top of an insect, as soon as you lift the net to get your killing jar or your pot in, the, in then the insect scarpers. So they're not, the, apart from the fact that they're not the easiest species to cap, to collect, you can, you, they're not very, most of them are so similar, you can't really identify them using photographs. There are very few species we can identify in, in the field or from, from images. So you definitely need to take a specimen and sort of work on it under a microscope. And, it, and in several species, if we've seen, we'll need to sort of dissect the only genitalia in particular and to, to sort of identify some of the males. The, the main issue with identification as well is that the key, which the only available key really is by MC Day, which was published in 1988. And that only covers 41 species. There are several. No, there are, it doesn't include the new, new ones, which have colonize so there are three species which aren't covered and it's not the most user-friendly key either it's not laid out very well the, the, the actual key and the diagrams you need to look at are actually in different parts so you have, you're endlessly flipping from one part of the key to the next and, and, but unfortunately that's the only key that is available at the moment another issue basic around the northwest species is that this list probably won't really change much over time. Unlike a lot of Hymenoptera, they're not sort of, they don't fly a great deal as part of their life cycles. So basically they're not expending, extending their range northwards particularly rapidly unlike, unlike some species. Most of them tend to be sort of say, still occupying the same geographical locations they were sort of 20 or 30 years ago. So, Basically, this list will probably be sort of up to date in another 20 years or so. It's highly unlikely we're going to get a huge influx of new species. When you do collect, I suggest you send all your records basically to on iRecord because they'll be verified by the experts at the Bees, Wasps and Ants Recording Society. That, that, that's probably the only real real way you're going to get sort of your records i've verified i mean in cheshire i can i can probably do one or two species but i'll say they're so similar and as you say images aren't really useful so that's probably the best way to submit your records you can tell how under recorded this species are on the nbn atlas there are just over ten thousand records of pompillid wasps out of a total of over of nearly 800,000 records. And considering that's the Pompillid wasps are about a quarter of the British wasp species, it's, yes, it does show the extent of how under-recorded they are. So if anybody's got plenty of time on their hands, a new key would be helpful, or perhaps even an equivalent of the bees wasps and the bees handbook that George Ells produced a couple of years ago. We live, well, hopefully something like that will appear in the not too distant future which will make hopefully make life a lot easier i'll say the references there's res handbook which you can load download from their website it's volume six part four the spider wasps i'll say it's not the most user-friendly publication but i'll say it's the only one that's available at the moment the Bees Bewars website is where most of the species accounts were taken from. Unfortunately, as I say, most of them are over 20 years old now, so they may have changed since then. 
and the images used were obtained from via BWAS members, which we sort of obtained from when we did the Cheshire Mam Cheshire Accurate Atlas a few years ago. And the Cheshire and the Lancashire Bee Atlas were used for the local species lists. So I'll stop sharing there and hopefully if you've got any questions, I'll do my best to sort of answer them for you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Tony. That was a a real whistle top stop tour. You got through, you know, an awful lot of species there. Um, and, you know, they really come across as a very fascinating, or albeit elusive group. Um, and yeah, just shows really surprising how poorly recorded this, this family is. And I was just uh, sort of going through um, your, your and Carl's atlas of, of the Cheshire Aculeates. And even though you, you, you say that there's, there's five that haven't been recorded since um, 1950, but there's a whole load more that haven't been recorded according to your atlas sort of since the turn of the millennium. It's, it almost seems most of them are, are sort of get older records now. And uh, even though there's quite a, a breadth of species, it's. Uh, there really does need to, a lot of work to be done, it seems, in, in Cheshire on this group. Well, basically, there's very few people out there looking. I actually looked at the record, the record submitted to the local record centre from 2015 to 2020. And I think I saw there's actually three records of Pompilids were submitted throughout that period. One, one of which wow. was found at, at a malaise trap in Wilson Eyes, and I think two more were from Brian Foamstone in South Cheshire, so South or South or West Cheshire. So there's only sort of a few select people out there who sort of seem to be looking for these things. Yeah, um, and, they, and they <laughs> seem like you need quite a bit of patience to... to yeah, exactly, to yes. Them. And the sort of the right weather as well, sort of. Do, do the... Liana, do the Cheshire Bee Group sort of um, also look for the Pompilids, or is that something they will um, be doing? In the future? We haven't yet, but we saw, yeah, we're opportunistic. If we see anything out and about, we'll have a go. Um, yeah, I've got a few to ID, but as um, Tony says, some of them are quite difficult. So, um, yeah, there's one or two which go through the key really quickly, and they're good. <laughs> there's a few that are yeah, a bit harder. Right. Well, well, thank you very much indeed, Tony, for uh, for that talk. And we'll we'll go into some questions. But I just before that, I just wanted to mention to everybody who's still here that just about World Museum in Liverpool and and the fact that we we have one of the major entomology collections in the country and it's paid for by you, you lot, the tax taxpayers. Um, and, and that is to look after those collections and make make free access for all of you to actually use those collections. And I'm sure Tony and, and Liana would vouch for the fact that we've got good representation of the Pompilids within the collection. Is that it varies yeah. from what it I've varies. seen. Okay. Right. OK. So maybe <laughs> some gaps can be filled there as well. And, but if but if you if you'd like to come and visit the museum and use the extensive library microscopes and the collection, then you just need to um, sort of get in touch with Tony Hunter, assistant creator of entomology, and perhaps Liana, you could put a, just a, his email address into the into the chat for those who are, who are interested. And uh, I know many of you have come in the past for, for workshops and various other events, but um, you are all very welcome. Please do make use of, of the collections. Right, over to the first question then for Tony. Uh, and this is from Antti Antonucci. And, I'm, and I apologize for any poor pronunciation there. Is there any significance in the number of segments in the antennae for male or female, fi male or females and for function? It doesn't seem to be, it just seems to be just a structural difference. It might be that the males need longer antennae to sort of for, for sensory reasons, but there isn't, I've never actually come across anything in the literature which sort of says why there's a difference in the, the lengths. I just find it a useful way of uh, separating the two sexes. Okay. 
And the, 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 there's a uh, this goes across cuts across all hymenoptera, doesn't it? Where it does, yeah. There's, there's big bees differences. are the same. Well, unless anybody else knows anything else, that it's not something I've come across in any any, any of the literature from any of the other species. Okay, well, any, anybody is who, with, who knows an answer to that are very welcome to unmute themselves and, and contribute. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Um, so this is from Rod Hill. Evening, Rod. Hi, Rod. <laughs> are there similar species to the lead and sp spider wasp? As I think I photographed an odd looking wasp like this years ago. No, that seems to be the only species with that appearance. As its name suggests, it's of a, a dull black sort of specimen. I've not come across any sort of. Yeah. But well, it is quite a while ago. I mean, I'll have to find the picture now. But uh, what, what I remember is it was really odd looking and had huge spines on its legs. Yeah, that's a characteristic of this species. I don't think any other wasps families have that. So. All right. So uh, I could submit that to our recorders. I oh, yeah, send the image and chances are it'll be accepted. It. <laughs> yeah. We need all the records we can get. Yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're within Lancashire, it's a bit of a specialist to the Sefton coast, isn't it? Is that fair? It, it was in the June. Yeah. yeah, I found it. Yeah, I think most records from the Sefton coast because that's where most people go, <laughs> or have been in the past anyway. Hmm. I also saw, um, as an aside, Anthophorus the other day, feeding on red dead nettle. <laughs> Never seen it on that before. Always, always very nice to see. Okay, thank you. And, oh, and then there was another one from Rod then following that. Are Spacoides easily separated from heath spider wasps where they both occur? Yes, because they don't have the sort of spines on the legs. That's the first thing to look. Right, yeah. But they're very small. They're not very big. So a casual observation is it's not easy to see spines as they're whizzing around the ground. Well, the thing is about Spicodes, they'll spend more time on the wing right. than a spider, a spider wasp, you know, sort of. But prefers to spend more of its time running around on the ground rather than sort of flying around in the air. Right. Okay. So you can probably get on behaviour if nothing, even if, yeah. if nothing else. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question from Anthony. Um, in general, are these wasp species in decline, and if so, what are the main causes to such decline, such as habitat loss, predators, climate change, disease, pesticides? pesticides etc well the obvious one would be habitat loss but obviously we know so little about a lot of these species it's hard to say what the sort of population status is at the moment i mean there doesn't seem to be that much decline that we can find it's i say it's just that it seems to be a lack of re lack of records seems to be the main issue and there hasn't there hasn't been a recent status Review has there of no, not, not of this, as not as I'm aware of this group. No, I said the last one was in the 1990s. Yeah, it seems seems really needed for Aculeus, don't they? They have they have changed so much. Um, yeah, well, interestingly, this unlike a lot of the sort of other Aculeus groups, we've had very few new species of this of these groups colonising from the continent. Yes, I An, uh, a lot of can I ask or make a comment uh, yeah, from what sure. I, I I'm in New York State <laughs> uh, listening to you and uh, from what I've seen over in the states uh, a lot of new species are being found because there's you know scientific capabilities from DNA uh analysis to determine the difference uh of them and uh i kind of view what i'm hearing you talk about in a limited uh species uh 
you know, collections and whatnot is they're not, they're not like the uh, threatened species of the day where everyone thinks there needs to be additional, uh, you know, scientific study. So uh, it just seems like a lot, there's a lot of old uh, g gaps in, in what's available uh, for, for them. And uh, they're not pollinators in general. I think that uh, everyone seems to want to, you know, save the pollinators. And so uh, you, you don't see a lot of uh, new research uh, being done or surveys even being done. Yeah, wasps aren't got particularly the most popular insects in Britain at the best of times. Yeah. <laughs> and I think given the, t I think people, lots of, I mean, lots of people like spiders and don't like wasps. So <laughs> the thought yeah. of these, wasps, it, these nasty it, wasps. Isn't it true that the wasps are, are responsible for most of the pollination, that, albeit accidental? It's hard to say. I mean, a lot yeah. of the, there's lots of these only tend to visit a very strict limit, you know, limited number of flowers, or if or sometimes they don't visit flowers at all. So, and, but, and they oh. have limited capabilities of even collecting that pollen. They're they're most of them are hairless, and and uh, you know don't don't collect it like like made, you know bees do, uh, where they can then spread it and stuff and they typically never really eaten much you know regarding you know pollen so i don't i'm not sure there's it's accidental pollination maybe more than you know uh, blatant intention okay oh brian do you want to comment yeah. um yeah thanks for an excellent talk um tony um when you mentioned um the two species of Serapalus, um, Serapalus maculata and Serapalus variegata. You had maculata as the RGB1 species when it, it's uh, variegata, you know, which is the rare one. I've had Serapalus maculata in uh, two North Wales quarries near Wrexham several times. It's, it's, just, you've, it's just you've reversed the species in your talk if you check it out. I would have to check the answer to wires website, see what the... You will. Serapilus maculata isn't uncommon. It's variegated as the... Yeah. The well, thanks for that, anyway. The talk was brilliant. Thanks very much. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. OK, um, we'll, we'll go over to the next question. Then. And, and apologies for the pronunciation of this next name, because I might be getting it wrong. But um, question from Patricia Lack. I'm sure that's wrong. Um, are species which prey on spiders on their webs more closely related to each other compared to nest building species? Is there a term for this strategy? Um, not that I've come across. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of, it's hard to say whether sort of, without actually knowing the genetics of these things, it's difficult to say whether how closely related they're going to be. Okay. I say it's not something I've come across in any of the literature, shall we say? Limited though it is. Okay, we'll move on to a question from Max Cantrell. What sort of microscope do you recommend? <laughs> well, I just anything. Uh, well, a binocular microscope with a sort of magnification up to times twenty is probably adequate for most purposes especially for insect identification for most, so do you think times 20 would do most from pillets well times 10 would probably do most of it but times 20 just for the sort of finer detail of some of the structural parts i mean that's the only, that's probably what most peculiar you know people use and that's i've you know me and carl have, ever, have only ever used that in the past Okay. Well, yeah. Well, if, if and if you only need that sort of magnification, then you don't need a very expensive microscope. Um, 
So it's, just, like, it's like most things, it depends on what you can afford. Yes, certainly. I mean, you can get ha hand lenses that will do times 20. So you can, um, yeah, yeah, by the sounds of it, they're quite quite accessible then, this, this yeah. group in terms of... I mean, yeah. I would think the 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 more important issue is if you're interested in photographing what you're looking at is to get get one and you can get them for a hundred dollars uh, where you can uh, plug them into your, you know your computer they're digital and they'll they'll photograph what you're looking at if you're interested in getting uh, you know photos of what you may be uh, looking at. Thank you, Anthony. And, and of, of course, you can get attachments yeah. for eyepieces to attach your smartphone onto. And you can get one where you just take one eyepiece out and you put a camera in that if you haven't got a trinocular microscope. Um, and they and, and to get reasonable images, it's yes, it's, it, you don't have to have a very expensive setup nowadays. Yeah. Um, if, if you do want to take images for a publication or, or something, then we do have quite a, an advanced or at least it's a very expensive setup within, within the museum that you are very welcome to use. It's a sort of a, uh, a stack shot setup where we, we can get the whole plane of focus by stitching the images together in helicon focus, I think we use, but you're very... Yeah, you're very welcome to come in and, and use that setup for publications. But yeah, I think there's lots of affordable or more affordable than there used to be options for photography and microscopes. Okay. Okay, a question from Vivian Russell. Hi, Vivian. I know you from, from a number of years ago now. Um, how do spiders defend themselves against these wasps? Basically, they'll probably try and attack the wasp to fend it off. I mean, like they, like they probably would when they're trying to, you know, catch their own prey. I mean, they, they, I mean, it's basically a matter of the wasp basically has to keep out of the way of the spider's fangs. So that's the main defense of the spider. Which is unfortunately the wasp is just far too agile for the spider to get, you know, usually to sort of you know, defend itself properly. And also, I think Pompilids being long, narrow, you know, wasps, there's not a lot for the spider to aim at. <laughs> so basically, um, they'll just, you know, say that's their main defense. There's no other that have read off, read off as far as I can see. And obviously the long legs mean that the wasp can sort of keep out of reach from the spider quite happily. Okay, thank you, Tony. Okay, a question from Helen Smith of the British Arachnological Society. I was, I, I was thinking actually with a gr group like Pompilids, if, you know, if you're looking for places a particular spider families are found because you're a spider recorder, you might be more likely to come across these these wasps hunting for them. Um, but he, yeah, here's, here's the question. You mentioned that Orplosus carbonarius. Yeah, Orplo, Orploplus. Orploplus, yeah. The one that chews the legs off. <laughs> yeah, chews the legs off its prey. Is it the only species that does this? I work on Dolomedes species and sometimes sets of excised legs. Should, presumably you, you find, Helen, any possibility this is a, the work of a pompilid? So Dolomedes are the, are the, are the raft spiders, aren't they? Yeah, I've never, I've never come across anything about raft spiders being prey of pompilids in the literature. I mean, apparently from what Day says about, they only actually prey on about 45% of the British spider species anyway. So, and I've never heard Dolom Dolomedes mentioned. So that's probably a sort of something else causing that. 
And I would have thought a rasp spider is quite a large prey for a wasp that size. Yeah, yeah I, I, just... I imagine imagine difficult to catch as well. Sorry, Helen, please. Um... I think I think there are some um, American pompilid species that prey on some of the American Dolomedes. But I mean, if you ever come across any references, I'd be really, really interested to know. Yeah, so would I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Wow. Oh, yeah, thanks for that question, Helen. OK, um, a question from Max Cantrell. Do males and females have differing lifespans? Yeah, it seems to in most hymenoptera that the male has a sort of slightly shorter lifespan than the female. Because you think about it, the, the sole function of a male is just to mate with the female when she emerges from the nest, and that's it basically. So, you know, in bees, the work you know, the females tend to have a longer life cycle than the males. So it's probably the same with wasps as well. Okay. Okay. A, a question from Finley H. I often struggle to distinguish between pompilids and ichneumonids in the field. Any tips? <laughs> the, an obvious one is a behavioural one, is that pompilids tend to do a lot more flying around and they're a lot more obvious than, you know, pompilids, which tend to spend most of the time wandering, you know, on the ground or sort of in low vegetation. Although, I mean, I'm not sure what do, are there ichneumonids with sort of very you know have spines on their legs like pompilids do i'm not i'm not really an, i'm not really an expert on nick newmans you need to ask my ex colleague about that yeah uh, do you, do you, i suppose the average ichneumonid would it female would it normally have a longer ovipositor the female would yeah that's that's one obvious thing to look for although there are odd from pillage where the ovipositor is quite obvious in the female, but not that many as far as I'm aware. Right. What about differing them in the field from Svekids? Svekids tend to be sort of a lot more chunky than the Pompilids and the Newmans, don't they? They tend to be more sort of a bit more robust insects. They're not as long and thin. Okay. So you so you think so it's like a small specid could be a pompilid, possibly like a small slender. It's unlikely. Oh, there is one specid, the tripoxylon, which does actually feed on spiders as well. So that's a long. That seems to be a long, sort of thin-looking insect. So there's probably some very there's some you know probably some close relationship there. But that's the only one I could think of as far as the specidae are concerned. Okay. Okay, thank you, Tony. Okay, we've got, we've got one last question in the chat that I can see. Um, and this is from Ishtak Arkmud. Uh, again, apologies for pronunciation. Um, do you have any Pompilidae collections from India? Do we know much from India, do we? Not that I'm aware of, I think. It might be the odd one in the collection, but no, we don't have any discrete collections, if that's what you're talking about. No, I've sort of never come across any. Mind you, I've never really looked at the sort of foreign pompilids at Liverpool, so I'm not sure what's in there. I mean, I suspect a lot of them haven't been identified properly and a lot of them don't have any data, useful data with them. So I would say it's highly unlikely as far as Liverpool Museum is concerned. I guess most of the, the field work involving aculeates have been in places like Turkey and Greece over, over the years. Yeah, that's the main, that's the main source of our local uh, sort of foreign material yeah, in recent years. Okay. 
Mark Taylor's got his hand up. And I've... <laughs> Oh, it's just something that's anecdotal, um, as, as if to understand how they put spiders down, they pack a very sharp, jolting sting on pilots, and it uh, doesn't last for long, but it certainly grabs your attention, and I've, I've found the smaller ones are the ones that cause the most uh, attention grabbing when they get you. And I've, I've held the net closed, sorting out the pooter or the tube and, and, and not paid attention and been hit in the thumb a couple of times. And it uh, doesn't last very long, but for their size, they do command respect, the females. Yeah, I think anybody, any insect that takes on a spider needs to be respected anyway. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, thank you for sharing your experience mark i hope that doesn't put anybody off catching them in the net but i yes no it's not some group I, i've ever really gone for so uh, although the I, I don't know if if anyone's ever been sort of spiked by one of the uh ophion ichneumonids from the when you're turning over your your egg boxes in them in a moth trap they're they're pretty painful i was surprised i was surprised by that um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit more careful now. Okay, there's a, there was a question from Trevor Smith, actually, it was sent directly to me. Um, what percentage catch prey before locating suitable nest sites? The, a lot of the time, they seem to find the nest site and then go and catch the prey, if that, make, if that makes sense. Okay, so, mo so, so most of them prepare their prepare their nest. Yes, and then, and then they'll sort of go and find something to stock it with. Okay. Yeah, especially I mean the one that produces the wax, the clay cells. They'll sort of produce the cells, then go and capture a spider to sort of stock them with. So on the whole, they seem to be sort of prepare their nest first and then go and stock it. Okay. If, if you like. How far will they forage? Because if they're going to drag them along the ground, that's not far. From it. <laughs> it seems they sort of just seem to sort of patrol their own small little small area and just sort of grab any spiders which are unfortunate enough to be sort of in that area at the time. Okay. I mean, one thing I haven't found in any of the literature is how many spiders an average pumpilid actually catches. But sort of, it can't be that many, I would have thought. Okay, okay, thanks, Tony. I, um, further to your point, Gary, I've been caught by Ophion taking them out of light traps as well, and it kind of hurts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, I'm, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's, who's experienced that. A good, a good, yeah, a good lesson anyway, isn't it? To, to, be, to be wary of them. <laughs> um, so, so, we're so we're talking about order then. So of, of, of what the females are doing. So would, I, I presumably they're, they're mated as soon as they emerge, as in with most... Yeah, like most hymenoptera, yeah. And then they're going to build Then they'll nest. go and sort of start okay. creating a nest and go and start hunting. Okay. And, and in between times, re-energising on, on some specific flowers. Yeah, I don't know what the ones that don't visit flowers do, I'm not really sure. Unless, unless they're visiting flowers that nobody knows about. Okay. Well, it does seem odd that that particular genus doesn't sort of, hasn't been recorded on any flowers of any description. Now, are they pretty much solitary? Very. Yeah. So yeah. it's the queen is the queen and she does everything. Yes. <laughs> As opposed to having a queen worker kind of yeah. set up where... Yeah, it's just... So it's just a female makes a nest, she stocks it, she catches all the prey and... and there's no workers at all. There's, no, just, there's no male involvement. Non-social group. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can, uh, can I ask another question? So, so on some of the ones you talked about, 
they're they're species related as to the wasp and the spider. And uh, are there any issues now with the phenology of the, the two? In, in other words, with climate change, a lot of times things change, you know, from a temperature range. And so for, for floral, you know, the, the flowers are blooming before the insect yeah. has hatched. Does the same, can the same thing be happening with any of these uh, species related ones where the range uh, where they coexist uh, is changing and it'll throw it out of kilter? Not that I'm aware of, it doesn't seem to be happening at the moment. I mean, it might be that this, you know, spiders are probably act, have a, are active a lot longer than the wasp with, you know, the wasp might have a sort of a very short flight flight period where the spiders are active throughout a long, you know, throughout a long period throughout the year, maybe. So it might be that the spiders will be active a lot more if the weather gets milder. So it probably won't be an issue on, on that respect. No. So do you, okay. But could but could this could the wasps be needing a certain size of prey or will they just is it more of a volume thing? It's more of a volume thing. I say it seems that they take a different different size prey no matter what. Because I mean, it seems that there's sort of the lay female eggs on largest the fertilized eggs which develops on to females seems to be laid on the larger spiders and the unfertilized male eggs on the smaller ones. So it seems like they take a range of sizes. I suppose if you're you know, restricted to a certain area of foraging, then you have to take whatever comes along. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's so complicated, isn't it? And without without really careful research, you, these things are very hard to, to test. Of course, if they're, if they're very specific to what they you know where they're um what flowers they're visiting as well then they need to be in yeah in sync with the phenology of, of that um yes yeah, well it's just fascinating <laughs> subjects and uh okay uh so there's an uh, another question i can see there from ched do they all carry their prey backwards not as I'm aware of, I think they just carry, some of them do, but some of them drag it forward, some backwards. It's just sort of, there's no sort of real obvious distinction from what I can see. Can you identify the species by the way they carry the prey? Like some wasps will carry flies. Oh, you've muted yourself, Rod. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> You got about halfway of the half of the question. <laughs> <All right>. Yeah. <laughs> Can you identify the, the species of Pompilidae by the way they're carrying their prey? Not that I'm aware of. I've never actually come across that mentioned in any of the literature, so I presume not. I mean, one thing I did wonder about whether you could actually identify the spider and work out what the Pompilid was from doing it that way. <laughs> yeah, A plus B. Equal. Yeah. <laughs> so the um, the wasps they're not flying with their prey then. No, they're walking along the ground. They're dragging it along the ground physically. So it's so if they've already built an, a, a nest site, it's got to be very local then, surely yeah. to get back to there. Yeah, they're not going to sort of build a nest site that's miles, you know, miles how, away or whatever. So how far are we talking about? How far are they going to going to get going to be Dragging their prey as a. I suspect you know you're talking meters rather you know meters rather than sort of a huge distance. Yeah, and I suppose they've got to. So they're gonna they're gonna fly and they're gonna find their prey, but then they've got to navigate along the ground to get back to the nest site. Yeah, or some of them will just go to a suitable site, dig and dig a dig a sort of a hole or find a nest site and just dumping in whatever's available i mean i suspect they have no sort of what's in their own territory that's suit, going to be suitable for the site for raising the larvae right okay uh, okay over to a question from lois clark 
Do pompilids construct nests in a similar way to solitary bees, especially if they're using different size spiders for male and female eggs? Not that I'm aware of. I think they just sort of... The nest site seems to sort of vary with different, different wasps, but there's no of... There's very little known about the sort of nest structure. It just seems to be sort of uh, uh, whatever's available. So, you know, if it's using a hole in dead wood, it's just whatever's, you know, whatever size the hole is, then that's what they'll use. Okay, so it might not be as sort of elegant as some of the solitary bees. No, definitely not. So it's probably just dig a hole in the ground, shove the spider in, and seal it up afterwards. Okay. Did, can I, did can I come comments? in? Yeah, please do, Lois. Um, yeah, I mean, I find it a, a very, with bees, it, was, uh, it seems a fairly fascinating uh, process that, that, you know, you get the males that hatch out first and then the females afterwards, which means that there must be some kind of process going on whereby um, female let, eggs are laid first and then male ones. And I, did, I wondered if there was something, you know, how... Um, the wasp, you know, does it? How does it know that it's going to sort of lay a sort of male or female egg? So it gets a big spider for the female um, uh, egg and um, a small one for the uh, um, unfertile eggs. I mean, how 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 does that all? And how does anyone know that? Well, that seems to be a characteristic of most Hymenoptera. Saying, you know, males always seem to at height. Emerge from unfertilized eggs. So I suspect it's sort of, I mean, I'm not sure how they've worked that one out, but sort of. I know it's just, it seems very, very weird that, that, that the unfertilized eggs go on the small spiders and the fertilized ones go on the large spiders. I mean, well, obviously, I mean, if a female, what the female pompilid is a lot larger than the male, so it obviously it needs more food. That's probably the only reason for mm. it it's mm. like you know bumblebees where you know a queen emerges from a larvae which is well fed compared to your typical worker i mean or do they do they store up um spiders of different sizes and then go around and lay eggs or do they kind of catch the spider and then lay the egg as, as they as they get them sort of thing they'll catch the spider lay the egg and then that's got them up for the next one right and do they ever lay more than one egg per spider? Does that ever happen? No, that doesn't happen. Unless another species comes along and lays its egg on the spider, then. Yeah, right. Well, that's that's the only instance where that's likely to happen. Right. I just wondered if anyone had constructed a, a kind of like a, a, a kind of test chamber, somehow managed to tempt these spiders, uh, these, these wasps in to sort of, kind of watch them laying eggs or grabbing spiders in. I, I, does, does anyone actually do that kind of sort of work? I've not come across anything along those lines. I mean, not to say it doesn't happen, but... Sounds painstaking, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. It's like you need a lot of patience. Yeah. But some people do anyway. do these sort of studies, don't they? They must do. Do um, we know anyone? And have they kind of published any kind of results or information or I've not come across anything I mean even in the sort of BWAS literature you know the newsletter you, you get very little on from pillids I mean I'm not it seems to be pretty much a minority subject as far as Hymenoptera goes a minority amongst minorities <laughs> yes I was just going to say, you got a bit of time on your hand there, Tony. <laughs> Not used to that. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much for sort of answering that. It's obviously quite a sort of kind of complex, complex question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, I, and I was thinking, um, sometimes Tony Hunter brings in spiders, doesn't he, Tony, with ichthymonid larvae? already on on you know uh preying on the spider uh, and i just wonder who who wins if, if a pompilid picks up a parasitized spider 
Um, Which whichever hatches first. <laughs> well, the Ikin wanted uh, larvae are normally hatched already. They're, perhaps they wouldn't be. Perhaps those sorts, those spiders wouldn't be chosen if they. Yeah, I mean, it depends what effects laying, having an Ikin egg laid on it has on the spider. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's it's not it's it's going to be exhibiting different behaviour. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Do you also get um, tachinids attacking spiders? They're flies. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I have to have to look that one up. I don't, I, I, yeah, I don't know. How many uh, eggs will a the a wasp a female wasp generally lay? Unfortunately, I've not been able to find that out. It doesn't seem to be, nobody seems to know. It's no, not come across it in the literature. The only thing I could think of is that the one that creates the clay cells has been known to you know, create batches of about 30 odd cells in a specific nest. So that might be sort of give you some indication of sort of the amount of eggs it's likely to lay. I can't say it's going to be, it's going to be a huge number given the sort of lifespan. So and so once they lay the egg on, on the, the spider, is there any other involvement with the wasp in, in watching uh, that have, you know, uh, develop or are they off, you know, laying another one or at some point in time, maybe late in the season, I assume they're just, they've worn themselves out and yeah. they die. I think there's what I read one species, I can't remember which one it was, but that does seem to, the female does seem to guard the nest. But apart from that, the rest of them mm -hmm. is just, you know, it's left to it, basically. We just block them up. Yeah. And hope that sort of nothing comes along. I mean, I'd say there was mention of ants being a nuisance to sort of. Well, some of well these they species. must have, they must have predators. Uh, that they have to be concerned about as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it seems that in this country it's robber flies and tiger beetles seem to be the main sort of predators because obviously they're sound, found in the sort of similar yeah. sorts of habitat. I guess it's quite an investment, really, isn't it, with pompilids? The females have, have got to go and you know, they're not just laying an egg on something, they're going to invest in in, in feeding them and digging a, a nest site. So it's not going to be hundreds, is it? No, I think okay. you're talking sort of tens at most, I would think. Is, Tony, is when the um, wasp paralyzes the spider, does do they do more than that? Because obviously that spider is then immobile and subject to deterioration. So does she inject says, something in there to stop it rotting or and attracting other species. No, as far as I'm aware, where the once the, the spider's paralyzed, but it does it does stay alive. So I don't think it sort of does degenerate till it dies. The, the idea is obviously sort of the spider's got to be in a suitable condition for the larvae to feed when it hatches out. So it's got to sort of you know just stay there for I mean it could be two weeks before the egg hatches in some species. So it's yeah, not over there. That's hell of an anaesthetic. They don't <laughs> want to kill them, do they? Yeah. No, it's not in the best interest to sort of sting them and sort of cause too much damage. And I say in some species, the spider actually can still move about, so it's not totally paralyzed. I mean, with in, with the with the ichneumonids, they still, even though they've been parasitized, the spiders still feed, don't they? Yeah. So they're they're, they're very fresh as they're getting eaten alive. Um, okay. Well, there's there's no more questions in the chat that I'm aware of, or or direct messages to me, and I can't see any hands up. So, you know, if if anyone has any further questions, then please speak up now, please unmute yourself and, um, and, and put your question forward. 
otherwise we'll 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 close down the the webinar I have a question. It may not be relative to what was presented. Uh, it has to do with the equivalent of uh, cuckoo bees. Are there cuckoo wasps yes. in any way <laughs> that exist where they would <laughs> uh, you know, lay their eggs in other wasp nests to be raised by uh, them? Yes, as far as I'm aware, there are species of those in this in this part of the world. Yeah, but it's, no, say it's mainly bees. Well, I learned okay. a lot today, so I oh. I thank you for uh, for having this session. Well, thanks for turning up. <laughs> yep.